So, uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture in this series of uh, Distinguished Minerva Lectures. Uh, the lectures are sponsored by uh, the Minerva Foundation, which is headed by uh, uh, Luisa Reinholz, who, along with her husband Robert, are by training mathematicians, and they are friends and warm supporters of mathematics in this area in particular in our department, also neighboring institutions. Uh, our speaker is uh, Professor uh, Hugo Dubnil Copin. I have to say professor because he looks so young. Uh, he got his degree 12 years ago, long 12, 12 years ago, which is also the time when the lectures started. Uh, and he's a professor at the Institut des Autres Scientifiques, which is a, an institution in France, somewhat akin to our Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, what we saw yesterday was, uh, was a very lucid presentation of, which is sort of a hallmark of uh, Hugo's work. Uh, it concerns a simply stated model which is motivated by consider trying to illuminate phenomena of interest in science, chemistry, chemical physics, physics. But then it leads to fascinating mathematical questions and it turns out that the resolution uh, sheds light and in fact leads to developments in areas where beautiful mathematics meets from different directions, probability, analysis, conformal structures, and so on. Uh, so the speaker is uh, gifted both in see seeing through all of this with uh, amazing clarity and also his ability to present it to us in a clear way. So we are all looking forward to the talk today. Thank you very much for the very nice uh, introduction and thank you for coming back uh, after yesterday. So today we are going to discuss uh, another uh, model. We, are, we forget about uh, self-forwarding book. I just want you to remember that for self-forwarding book there was this phase transition occurring when we were defining the model with this x to the number of uh, edges or length of the walk, and depending on x, if it was equal to one of a mu c, or if it was smaller or larger, they were drastically different behaviors. So these were an example of a, an example of a phase transition, which is one among like an infinite number of examples of phase transition. So phase transition in physics is just, I mean, just, I mean, it means a very dis I mean, a discontinuous change in our model when you vary the parameters of the model continuously. So yesterday, you move x continuously, and exactly at one of the mu there is drastic change in what is happening. There are many other examples of phase transition. I mean, the one you know uh, in everyday life is uh, between I know, water and ice, and things like that. Um, you have between uh, ferromagnets and uh, paramagnets, you know, this, this materials that lose their uh, magnetization when they are heated. Uh, you have many other examples. And today I want to discuss one example of phase transition that occurs when you try to model a porous medium. Okay, so our porous medium, we will think of it as being the hypercubic lattice. Okay, so it's really, think of Z2 if, uh, if you are nice with me and you just... Uh, uh, allow me to only draw in two dimensions, but you could go in higher dimension, of course. And the idea is to think of our porous medium as being a random subgraph of this graph. Okay? And the simplest way of defining a random subgraph of this graph would be to say, okay, my subgraph will have exactly the same set of vertices. The vertices will be ZD. Okay, so my subgraph omega will have a set of vertices ZD, but the set of edges would be a subset, so E of omega would be a subset of the set of edges of my original graph. Okay? Something that I will actually encode in the following way, I will say that omega is a function from the set of edges of my graph into 0, 1. You know, it's true or false. Like it's 0 if you don't have the edge in this set, and one if you have it. Okay? That's, so this is, now it's a function from edges to 0, 1, but think of it as a graph. 
And the goal is to understand connectivity properties of this group. So, as for now, I didn't tell you what omega is. I just told you, okay, you define it as an object in this set. So now I need to tell you what is the probability measure that I'm going to put, how I just take this graph omega at random. And I'm going to do the simplest thing ever for every edge. I'm going to toss a coin, a bias coin, and with probability p, I'm going to say omega e is equal to 1, and with probability 1 minus p, omega e is equal to 0. So omega e is going to be a Bernoulli random variable of parameter p. And I just do that independently for every edge. I mean, you will see at the end of the, of, of the talk that I will change that, but for now, let's just look at this model. It's called Bernoulli percolation. It was introduced in uh, 57, which is pretty late, actually, for a model coming from statistical physics. The reason is that why it's a very natural model from the point of view of probability, right? I mean, if you take a class on probability, first thing you are going to uh, learn to, to manipulate is exactly independent random variables. So if you want to pick a subgraph at random, the most natural thing is to pick edges independently at random. Okay? From the physics point of view, it's not such a natural model, actually. You have, for instance, the easing model, which is a model of, of magnetism, is much more natural because in physics, what you are going to do is you are going to look at your system, think that your forces are acting like that and like that, and define a Hamiltonian or something that witness that, that behaves like the forces should behave. Here, it's a little bit less clear what is the physics... Uh, uh, motivation that will drive you towards this introduction. So this, that's why it happened pretty late compared, for instance, to the easing model, but it's a very, very natural model from probability. And one of the nice things about this model is that it exactly undergoes a phase transition like here, in the sense, in the following sense, that there exists a parameter PC, and this is really a parameter that depends on D, and this parameter is between 0 and 1, such that the probability that there exists an infinite connected component in omega, where this probability is 1 if p is larger than pc, and 0 if p is smaller than pc. So in order for this to be true, I need d to be larger or equal to 2. In one dimension, it's pretty easy to prove that whatever the p is smaller than 1, strictly, you never have an infinite connected component in your graph. Okay? But what I'm claiming is that as soon as you are above dimension 1, strictly, then there is a critical parameter which is non-trivial. It is between 0 and 1, so that above it, in some sense, p is sufficiently large that you have an infinite connected component almost surely, while below it, you don't have an infinite connected component almost sure. OK? So this is, again, a typical example of a phase transition. Okay? I'm not going to justify this claim. Actually, you can try if you want. I mean, as a hint, I would recommend first to try to prove that for p very small, this is equal to 0. Then try to prove that in dimension 2, when p is very close to 1, it's uh, strictly positive, and then try to deduce it's equal to 1 by ergodicity, and it's uh, also uh, decreasing in D, PC. The larger the D, the smaller the PC. That's for people who don't want to listen to me for the next. Uh... Okay. My goal is not to prove that because what I want to do is actually not really tell you about phase transitions. I want to tell you about a mathematical theory that allows you to interpret and to do things uh, about statistical physics and phase transition. And this theory is a theory of sharp threshold. So let's keep in mind this, uh, this model of percolation, and in particular the fact that it's a random omega is a random object, a random function in 0, 1. I mean, from edges to 0, 1. But let's keep that on the side for a moment, and let's imagine just that I'm looking at a function f 
which is defined as a function from a set E into 0, 1. Think of E as being uh, your set of edges. But think of E as being finite. And let's think of a sequence of such functions. Okay? Let's really imagine that the cardinality of EN is, is N. It's just growing. Okay? So I'm going to say that a sequence of functions, so definition, a sequence Fn undergoes a sharp threshold if the following occurs. I want the existence of two sequences, Pn and delta n, such that when I look at the expectation, so I, I should maybe have told you, this measure here, which consists in picking, in saying omega e is equal to 1 with priority p and to 0 with priority 1 minus p, I'm going to give it a name. Okay? I'm going to call that p p. Okay? And when I'm taking, so it's a measure, when I'm taking the expectation with respect to this measure, then I will denote it with a p. Okay? So here, I'm going to ask that the expectation of my function f, my function fn, sorry, is very small, is tending to zero. I mean, how did I put it? Maybe I should, sorry, do it in a consistent way with my notes. Yeah. So fn at pn minus delta n is tending to zero. At pn plus delta n, it's tending to 1. And I want that delta n tends to 0. Okay, so there are three things. And these three things can be summarized as often in one picture. So what I want is that if I draw this, this the function p gives expectation of fn. Okay. So fn is function 2 to the interval 0. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you uh, the 2, uh, 0, 1, yes, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, 2, 0. Yeah, it's a Boolean function, sorry. sorry. Thank you for this, because this, this was not, uh, not clear at all. So I want here that uh, when I draw this function, it's going to have a shape like that. It's going to be very close to 0. Then it's going to go very quickly close to 1, and the, if you want the window in which, well, no, it's never going above, but, but the window here should be between Pn minus delta n and Pn plus delta n. Okay? And the larger the n, the thinner this window is. Think of Pn as being fixed. I mean, I'm, I'm allowing Pn to move, but in all the examples that I will consider, actually Pn would be a fixed constant. Okay, so you get something which is flatter and flatter like that. That's the notion of the seconds undergoing a sharp threshold. So this notion of sharp threshold, it emerged uh, in the study of random graph, of random uh, subgraph of the complete graph. So it's R notion maybe that studies the following. So they picked EN, so here the cardinality will not be N, but they picked EN to be just all the pairs of I and J included in, uh, in the interval 1 to N. Okay? So it's just, you take, you interpret it like that, you imagine that you have N vertices, and these are all the pairs of vertices so you get a complete graph. You can imagine EN as the edges of the complete graph. And what you look is, you exactly look, for instance, to quantity like Fn would be the indicator function that the graph that you obtain is connected. So this thing here can be interpreted as a probability that your graph that you pick, your random subgraph where you pick edges at random with probability p is connected. Okay? 
So here, for instance, in this case, if you take Pn to be log n over n, and delta n to be much smaller than log n over n, I mean, something, I mean, yeah, literal of log n over n, but something going very, I mean, going very slowly to zero, you can prove that indeed at Pn, which is log n over n minus literal of log n over n, the probability that your graph is connected tends to zero. Why, if you take Pn plus uh, literal of Pn, then the probability tends to one. So that's maybe the first example where this was proved, and this can actually be checked almost by hand. This is kind of an exercise. But you can imagine all the quantities. You can imagine that Fn is indicator that there exists a huge connected component in my graph. For instance, a connected component of size uh, square root 10 or of size uh, maybe a little bit smaller than n, but uh, growing with it. In this case, you also have a sharp threshold, except it's not at log n over n, it's at 1 over n. And the delta n that you are allowed to take is 1 over n to the fourth third. So you again have this kind of uh, sharp threshold shape for, uh, for the point. By the way, because it's going to reappear, let's maybe define Fn with a capital F for the expected value at P of, uh, of the... Okay, so why did I introduce that? I introduced this notion of sharp threshold because in some sense it's a finite volume version of a phase transition. Think, for instance, of the case of Zd. So you think of En as being the edges in the box of size n in Zd. And think of Fn to be kind of the indicator function that there is a very big connected component in my graph, in my box. Okay, for instance, a connected component that has radius n over 2. in uh, the ball of size n of size n of 2. Well, again, here, what you can expect is that maybe if I'm lucky enough, this sequence of functions is going to undergo a sharp threshold at which Pn, well, exactly for Pn equal Pc. Right? You expect that as soon as you take something smaller then if you take Pn minus delta, and if you take Pc minus delta, you expect that the probability of having a huge connected component in my box should tend to zero, because there is no infinite connected component. And on the other side, you should expect that when you take Pc plus delta, then it should kind of tend to one, because this, this connected component that exists almost surely should be kind of everywhere and should uh, of course, I mean, I see a few faces that are like, no, no, I don't believe that. I mean, of course, it's not completely clear what I just said. I mean, well, first, what I said was clearly not clear. But uh, uh, my point is that even proving it is not, is not straightforward. But you could believe something like that. You could believe that there is a threshold. So think of sharp thresholds as being finite volume versions of phase transition. And what I want to do in the next... Uh, the remainder of the talk is tell you the, how one can prove that there is a sharp threshold. What are the tools that you have to prove a sharp threshold? So we are going to abandon a little bit the, um, the case of percolation for a moment and think more generally about Boolean functions. So how to prove a sharp threshold. So think, really, we are, again, just thinking of Fn as a function from 0, 1 to the En into 0, 1. So it's called the Boolean function. I'm going to think also, I did something, all the example there, and even the definition in some sense, kind of, they all underlined, I mean, they, they all had the, the property that Fn was increasing. Right? When P was increasing, when I'm drawing something like that, I'm suggesting that Fn is increasing. It's not necessary for this definition, but in fact, in all the examples, I'm going to use this property. So let's assume that Fn is increasing. Okay? 
So Fn really increasing in this, this thing. So the, the bigger the omega, the bigger the Fn. Something which is not completely clear, and you can think about it, it's, it's clear intuitively, but it's not clear to prove, is that that implies that Fn of p is increasing in p. The larger the p, the more open edges you are, you, you have, so it's very intuitive to think that if Fn is increasing in omega, then this should be increasing in p. It's not completely straightforward to prove. So that's another exercise for people who, uh, who don't want to listen. OK. So how will we prove a sharp threshold for a second? So now we always consider we have the seconds of Fn, and we want to prove a sharp threshold for this second. I mean, of course, not all sequences undergo a sharp threshold, but I mean, what are the criteria that I could think of which would allow me to prove a sharp threshold? Well, first thing, let me try to give you a first like hint on the strategy. So the strategy is going to be to study the derivative of Fn. Okay? And in order to study the derivative, I will need first to have a lemma, which is due to Margulis and Rousseau. And this lemma is saying the following. It's a very simple thing. It's saying Fn prime of p, so the derivative in p, I can rewrite it as the sum of the elements that are in En of the influence of my function Fn, where I need to tell you what the influence is. Well, the influence of Fn is somehow how much switching the value of e is going to impact my function. So influence of Fn, maybe let's put it here, the influence for an edge e of Fn is going to be the probability that Fn of omega is not equal to Fn of the flip configuration of omega at e. This is just the configuration where you change omega e to 1 minus omega e. So you keep exactly the same configuration, you just change the value of the bit e. Okay? So this is the, the inference, is the probability that if I change e, then I change the outcome. Okay? So this lemma is telling you, well, if I want to obtain the derivative of Fn, then I just need to sum the influences. That's, that's really not something difficult to prove. You, are, you can really prove it uh, by hand in some sense. But it's going to be a very useful thing, because these influences, they are actually very natural from the point of view of discrete math like discrete analysis. Are there questions? Or no? Good. So just to give you a few examples, if you take Fn to be the indicator that omega e is equal to 1, I would also just call it like omega e, then what is the influence of an edge? Well, for any edge which is not e, the influence is zero, because you can flip the edge there, it will never change a thing. And the influence of the edge E is one, because whatever the configuration, if you flip the edge, you will flip the edge. So here, influence, I mean, let's call it e zero. Influence E of Fn is just delta of E is zero. More interesting, maybe. What is the influence of, the, of Fn, where Fn is the existence, of a crossing from left to right in a box. So if I take an edge here, E, what is going to be the influence of E? Well, in order for the edge E to be influent, what must happen? First thing, it must be that if I close it, uh, if I, sorry, if I close it, there is no crossing from left to right, because then, if it's open or closed, doesn't change the outcome, right? 
So it should be that all the path crossing goes through this edge. And on the other hand, well, it should be that when it's open, there is a crossing, so there should be at least one path going through this edge and going from left to right. So the event in this case is going to be the event that there is a crossing like that and that there is a kind of dual surface of edges blocking the existence of path not, I mean, crossing without using E. Okay? So that's the inference in this case. So the inference is going to be the probability the probability of this, uh, this event. Okay? Is it clear what the notion of inference is? I, I, I tell you that's a rhetorical question. I don't think anybody is going to reply to me right now. But anyway. So this is the first uh, tool. How will we use it? Imagine that you manage to prove that the sum over the edges of the inference is much, much larger than, let's say, is larger or equal to a certain constant Cn, and think of Cn as being very large, times the variance of Fn. I mean, this is just a big word to say it's Fn of p times 1 minus Fn of p. Okay? Imagine I can prove that. If I manage to prove this thing, since I know that this is equal to the derivative, I end up with a differential inequality. I end up with a differential inequality, which is fn prime is larger or equal to cn times fn 1 minus fn. Okay. And this, if you think about it, this is just saying that the derivative of this thing is larger or equal to cn. Right? Ta da <laughs> Don't break everything. Um, okay, so that means this, and here you see that now if you define Pn such that, uh, let's say, Fn of Pn is equal to one half, right, exactly the balance thing, what does this thing imply? Well, it implies that Fn of Pn minus delta is going to be smaller or equal to 2 e to the minus cn delta, and that fn of pn plus delta is larger or equal to 1 minus 2 e of minus sn delta. Right? So you see that if cn is tending to infinity, then you can take delta n tending to 0 in such a way that you will have a sharp threshold at this pn. So the big game is going to be, can we get this kind of inequality where the sum of the inferences is much larger than the variance. That's going to be the game. And the good thing is that there are actually two abstract theorems that are kind of targeted exactly to do that. And I want to define them, I mean, to describe them to you, and then to, uh, to go back to percolation and tell you what we can do with it. So, first strategy to prove uh, star, it's going to be to use a theorem coming from discrete Fourier analysis. And this theorem is saying the following. It's a theorem, so there are like two, uh, two groups that, that uh, prove this theorem. So the first one is Bourguin, Kahn, Kalai, Katz, Nelson. I mean, you need to be careful not to forget a K and Lineal. This is 92. And there is another group of one person, <laughs> Talagon, in 94. And the theorem is basically saying the following. It's saying the sum of inferences Well, I, I let you think about the fact that it's always larger or equal to the variance. 
This is basically a discrete version of Poincaré inequality, or Parseval, or I mean, you can uh, name it in several ways. So the improvement is the following, is that they are going to prove not that the sum of inferences is smaller, is larger than the variance, but that the sum of inferences times something is larger than variance. And this something, oh, I should not write it like that, sorry. This doesn't seem to be readable. Is one over the log of one over the inference. There is a constant here, which is uh, something like log of uh, 1 over p, 1 minus p, but uh, let's, let's ignore that. Basically, it's telling you that a weighted sum of the inferences is larger than the variance. The reason why you managed to get an improvement... What's yeah? the denominator of factorization? Sorry? What's the, what's the denominator? So it's log of 1 over the inference. Yeah, okay, I'm... Uh, I should, you know, when, when you start not to be readable, you should adopt the strategy of Gedi Cosma, which is writing a huge sum like that. Put influence of Fn, and then put 1 over a huge thing, so log of 1 over the influence. It's a very good strategy, right? I mean, I mean of theory. course, it, sorry? It's a big theorem. It's a big theorem like that, yes? <laughs> I mean, I will always remember I was a PhD student and he came and gave this beautiful talk and at, at some point, so after like 20 minutes, we realized that nothing was written on the board, basically. And then somebody made him realize that, so he took a choke and started doing this huge sigma in the middle and nothing else. <laughs> what is happening? Anyway. Um, so the important thing here is that this theorem is telling you the following with respect to that. Maybe let's not erase this thing. It's telling you that if you can prove that all the influences are small, then you have your star inequality. So if influence of Fn is smaller or equal to epsilon for every e, then you have star with epsilon equal up with cn equal 1 over log of 1 over epsilon. Right? Simply just bound this thing by 1 over log of, uh, sorry, log of 1 minus. So what this theorem is telling you, and this is a go home message, is telling you small influences imply sharp threshold. Okay? But here there is something which physically, I think, I mean, so this came really from its hypercontractivity for uh, discrete Fourier analysis. It's really nothing to do with physics, but it tells something which I think is extremely deep from the point of view of physics. Because there is a special case, which is maybe you are lucky enough and your function f, fn, is symmetric under a group action that is transitive. Maybe all the influences are the same. Let's look at this case. So for instance, the typical example you should think of is take your torus and imagine that instead of looking at a crossing, think of the existence of a non-trivial, I mean a connected component having a non-trivial orthotopy. So if you do that, all the influences are the same, but then it's telling you something very useful because it's saying, well, either some influence is, say, larger or equal to log n over n. But if you have that, then you are summing, I mean, log n, uh, let's say log, uh, let me be more precise, log of en over en, so the cardinality. But in this case, when you sum over all the influences, they are all equal to that, so you get log en, which is in particular larger than log en times the variance, because the variance is smaller or equal to. Or, so in this case, you get n of prime of p is larger or equal to log n. Or, they are all smaller, but if they are all smaller, smaller than this, 
then the sharp threshold is telling you, well, if they are all smaller than this, then I have also the inequality with Cn, which is the log of that, log of 1 over that. So I get again that Fn prime is larger than log of En times Fn 1 minus Fn. So this was a very nice observation by Friedwood. And it's really saying any symmetric Boolean function undergoes the sharp threshold. There is no other way. But from the physics point of view, quantities that you look at are usually like thermodynamical type quantities. They are homogeneous. They are the same everywhere. And therefore, they are symmetric. So that shows why so many models actually undergo sharp, uh, I mean, phase transition, because just all these symmetric functions, they have to have the sharp threshold. They have no choice. I find it a, a nice, uh, nice feature. OK, uh, this, I mean, I should say this is the most refined result, but originally this idea of looking at abstract properties of Fourier uh, of, of, uh, of Boolean functions, this goes back to Rousseau. So this, this is maybe important to, uh, uh, to recall. OK. So in particular, I mean, this, I mean, for percolation, this type of quantity does undergo a sharp session. And to, I mean, on Friday, I will explain to you how this can be used, for instance, to guess what is the critical point of a percolation. So that was the first strategy. Let's look at the second strategy now. Yeah, you will forgive me. So the second strategy is more recent. Actually, it was not really used for that at the beginning, or not used at all for that. And it's based on what we call um, randomized algorithm. So there, really, maybe. Here it's like, a, I mean, it's really it's discrete Fourier, it's coming from discrete Fourier analysis. Here it's really going to come from randomized algorithm. So what is a randomized algorithm? So a randomized algorithm is a way of exploring the edges of your, uh, your uh, set EN, the edges, it's because I'm thinking of percolation, but all the bits of EN. So uh, an algorithm A is discovering edges one by one in a Markovian fashion in the sense that the way you choose the next edge to discover has to be just a function of what you discovered so far. You are not allowed to be predictive or anything. It has to be just a function of what you saw before. Okay? It is one by one. Until, well, until you discover so many edges that you know what Fn is equal to. There you stop. Until you determine Fn. So just Maybe for, because that's going to be an example that we would like to study, let's think of trying to find algorithms to discover the existence or not of a connection between zero and the boundary of a box. Okay? So there is one algorithm, maybe not the smartest one, which is like, okay, I look at the first edge in uh, any order, I discover it. Then I look at the second edge in this order, I discover it. And I just, you know, I fix at the beginning a list of edges, and I just discover them one by one. Well, at some point, I will discover, maybe at the very end, but I will discover either that I have a path from center to boundary, and in this case I can stop, because whatever I will discover elsewhere will not change the output. I already saw a path from zero to the boundary. Or, I will discover a closing surface, like a blocking surface of edges, that I know that from now on there is no way I will have a pass from zero to the moment. So I stop at this first time. So this is a stupid algorithm, but that's an example of an algorithm. Just to tell you that sometimes you can do smarter, 
what you could do, for instance, is you could start from zero and start exploring, if you want, the connected component of zero from inside. So what you would do is you would start from zero, you choose an edge, and you say, okay, is this edge open or not? Well, it's closed. Okay, too bad. I change and I look at this edge. Is it open or not? Ah, it's open. Okay, I move there. And now I look at one of the unexplored edges and I try to explore it. And I do that and I, when I block where I am, I just step back and see whether I have other edges to explore, etc. Et so from now, you are really exploring from inside the connected component. And again, either you are going to discover that you are in the connected component which is not connected to the boundary, in this case, you, are, you can stop because there is no path to the boundary. Or maybe you are going to reach the boundary. In this case, that means there is a path and you can stop. Okay? That's another algorithm to discover. Uh, so now, what is the equivalent of our BKKK result here? What is the thing that is going to give us a, sh I mean, a, a sharp switch? So it's an inequality that actually can be proved in a fairly uh, simple fashion uh, using a Lindenberg principle. It's a theorem which is due to O'Donnell, Sachs, Schramm, and Servetio, and that says the following. For any algorithm A determining Fn, or f, whatever it is, the variance of f is going to be smaller or equal. So again, you are going to have a sum of influences. And if I would stop here, it would not be a very interesting result. Well, think of this, forget that. This would be again point carry. But what the thing is saying that you can add, again, a quantity that you are not going to be able to read, which is a revealment. You don't like my test in colors. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a much better color. I agree. Okay. As usual, you are right. A revealment of the edge E for the algorithm A. So, what is this revealment? This revealment is just the probability that E is going to be discovered by the algorithm before it stops. So it's probability that E is uh, revealed by algorithm before it stops. And again, again, you see that you have a go, a second go home message in this talk, which is that if you have a second of function with algorithm determining them that are low revealment, then you should have a sharp threshold. Okay? So low revealment implies sharp threshold. Just to, to, to check that we, we are on board all together. What is the revealment of an edge for the stupid algorithm? Well, a priori, you have no control on it. It's in a alphabetical order, so, I mean, it's in, in, in fixed order, so it's just the probability that the algorithm stops before reaching this edge. And basically, this, I mean, you can better just bound it by one because you have no control on this quantity. So this, that's why this algorithm going in order is a stupid algorithm, because it could it gives you very high revealment. What is the, uh, the revealment of the second algorithm? Well, for an edge to be discovered, well, you know, I go, at, I mean, I am in my cluster, so in order to reveal an edge, one of the endpoints should be connected to this cluster, to this connected component. So it should be connected to zero. So the revealment of an edge is going to be bounded by the probability that one of the two endpoints is connected to zero. And this is fairly good because imagine you are trying to prove a sharp threshold for the probability that zero is connected to the boundary. Well, at least when this probability starts to be small, it's decent to believe that the probability of being connected to 
a given vertex is going to be small, and that therefore it's going to imply a sharp switch. Notice that it's not true that the revealment is very small for all the edges, because the edges neighboring the origin are actually revealed with very high probability. So you need to modify a little bit this algorithm, but really think of this algorithm as having low revealment. Okay, globally it has low revealment. If you define it like that, it's not true, but... Okay, notice also that it's not... I mean, these two theorems are not common... I mean, one is not really implying the other one, and just to give you an example is... In some sense, the best example of... I mean, the, 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 the Boolean function that has the smallest... I mean, the largest influence, sorry, is, I mean, total influence is majority. It's just, okay, is it true that there are more open edges than closed edges? And this, the sum of, I mean, the influence of one edge is what? It's, it's just a democracy, right? Oh, I mean, not in America, but in other countries, it's democracy. <laughs> so, the influence of an edge is that exactly everybody else is balanced, and I will give the majority to one of the two uh, groups. Okay? And this the probability that everybody else is balanced, you have like sum of Bernoulli random variables that should be exactly equal to volume over two, this is gonna be one over square root the, the volume. So it's very, very I mean when you sum on inference, this is give you square root of volume, this is very big. Remember that for instance uh, there we were getting log of the volume, right? So it's much better. On the other the, on the other hand, the revealment I mean, it's fairly easy to see that whatever algorithm you are going to choose, the revealment is going to be terrible because you will have to, you know, look at least at half of the edges. So the revealment is basically one half. So it's not the same theorem. They really tell you different things. Okay, did I forget something? No. Let's now go to our beloved uh, statistical physics. Let's look at what these theorems can tell you on um, Bernoulli percolation. So, there is one thing that you want to know on Bernoulli percolation. So application. To statistical physics. Is that, you see, there is this critical parameter at which we are expecting to have a sharp threshold, right? So at PC, if I look, for instance, at the probability that there is a macroscopic cluster, then it's going to look like that. So in particular, for P smaller than PC, the probability that zero is connected to the boundary of a ball of size n, this should tend to zero. Right? Because if it, was, if it was not tending to zero, then there would be an infinite cluster touching zero, but then it would uh, contradict the definition of P. But physically, actually, you expect something much stronger. You expect that this probability is decaying exponentially fast. As soon as you are below PC, this should go very rapidly to zero. And really think of this as the bottleneck in your understanding of this phase, which is the phase P smaller than PC, what we call the subcritical phase. Once you have this theorem, you can prove millions of things on this phase. As long as you don't have it, you are usually blocked at perturbative uh, results, so when P is very close to zero, or uh, conditional results, which consists in assuming that and then trying to this is really an extremely important result on Bernoulli percolation. I mean, on percolation. And this is, fortunately for us, a theorem, which was proved by two teams, a team of one, again, Menchikov in 86, and a team from here, as a man, Barsky, roughly at the same time. And it's a theorem that goes back already 20, but 30 years. Okay? So think of that as, I mean, I don't want to tell you everything you can prove on the, the, the subcritical phase, but really think of it that I, once I have this thing, I'm in very good shape. 
But the thing is that, so, so this implied like a lot of results for Bernoulli hypercollation. The problem is that Bernoulli hypercollation is only one example of a percolation model. There are millions of other examples and of important examples of, of uh, percolation models. So what I want now in the, in the last 10 minutes is to tell you about a few of them and then to tell you that these abstract theorems, they actually improve your understanding of these other problems, okay, of these other percolation models. Actually, now that I see that I don't have so much time, maybe I'm going to focus on two or three examples. But, um, okay, so a percolation model, now think of it as just a way of defining a, a random graph or a random set, subset of of the plane or of, uh, of Rd. So we had the Bernoulli percolation, but we could also decide that the state of edges are not independent of each other. Why would you, you know, stick only to dependent percolation? So there is another model, which is called the fortuin castellan percolation, in which the probability of a configuration is proportional well, it's proportional to p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of closed edges, I mean, okay, sorry, sum of omega e, sum of 1 minus omega e, so the first one is counting the number of edges with 1, and the other one the number of edges with 0, and if I was staying there, this would just be defining Bernoulli percolation, right, this would just a way of uh, of uh, just denoting the, the, the percolation model that I introduced in the beginning. But here, we are going to add a second parameter, Q, and just twist this by Q to the number of connected components. So when Q equals 1, it's Bernoulli percolation, but when Q is not equal to 1, it's a different model, and this time the edges are dependent of each other. Okay. Notice that here I'm doing something fishy, right? Because as soon as I am on an infinite graph, this makes absolutely no sense. Right? I need to be able to count the number of edges with 1, number of edges with 0, count the number of connected components. This doesn't work on an infinite graph. But trust me that you can just define it on a finite graph, for instance, a box of size n, and then let n go to infinity and get a weak limit and get an infinite volume emergent. So this is called FK percolation. And it's a fundamental example, actually, of percolation model. Because it's related to a whole bunch of, of statistical physics model, including a very classical one, which is called the Q-state POTS model. It's a model for ferromagnetism. And it's a model which is very important to study. So this is an extremely natural example of percolation. Let me give you another example of percolation model. This time it's not on a graph, but it's nice to, uh, to draw. It's the following. Let's say you take a Poisson point process, let's pick points at, at random in the plane, and let's write, I mean, let's draw the tessellation, the Voronoi tessellation of this point. So what is it? The, the cell of one point is just going to be the set of points in the plane that are closer to this point than to any other point. Okay? So each point has a cell, and now what you do is you just color cell in black or white with probability P. And P with, for, for black and uh, 1 minus P for white. Okay? And again, you get a random set, and you can study the connectivity properties of this random set. Okay? So this is called Voronoi percolation. Let me give you a last example of percolation, you know, which is always good to keep in mind, is that you can think of a percolation model by defining first a random function, that you think of it as a height at a point, and just decide that the vertex is open if it's larger, or if, if the function is larger or equal to a certain parameter, and it's closed if it's below this parameter. 
Okay? And then it's a whole new world that opens in front of you because you have a lot of choice in the random function. So typically the random function that you can take is the Gaussian free field, which is uh, uh, one of the simplest models to take. But I mean, you can also take, for instance, uh, um, Bergman fog percolation, which is a model where this random function is a Gaussian process with a certain covariance. And this is naturally emerging from, as a limit of, of uh, Kostlan polynomials. So it's, it's motivated by algebraic geometry. Okay, so you have, you have a lot of models coming from this thing. So you first pick a function phi from, uh, say, the vertices of ZD into R, and then you pick a parameter H, and you say that a vertex X. I mean, omega x is 1 if phi x is larger or equal to h. And you vary h. Here you vary p, here you vary p, here you vary h. Okay? So, if you go, I mean, for all these models, there is a phase transition. There is a pc, or there is a hc, above which you have an infinite connected component, and below which you don't have an infinite connected component. And in this range of p smaller than the critical parameter, you would like to prove this. The problem is that the strategy of these two papers are based on exact independence, full independence. And you see, none of these models is going to enjoy this property. Here, the edges are dependent on each other because there is dependency through the count on connected components. Here, even though the colors are chosen at random, the cells themselves came from this Poisson point process and if I give you information that there is a lot of black here, I'm telling you information on the cells. And therefore, I break independence. Here, all the functions that you are of interest that you are going to take have long-range dependency and therefore induce dependencies for your model. But the good thing with all these models is that all these measures they satisfy a weaker property than independence. They are what we call monotonic. In some sense, the colors, like the black or the open edges, they like each other. So the more open edges you are somewhere, the more you will get. And this monotonic property has a very nice application for, I mean, has a very nice consequence, is that this theorem, and the second one I erase it, I guess. Yeah, I erase it, but. The OSSS inequality and the BKKKL inequalities, they extend to these monotonic measures. And that changed completely the deal, because once you have these extensions, you can actually use these sharp thresholds to prove this theorem for all these percolation models. So what happened is that historically, uh, it started with first BKKKL for actually percolation, for really a per degree percolation, and this was done by Bolobash and Riordan in, in 05. But then, people realized you can go further, and in, for two-dimensional models, this BKKL result was used to prove the sharpness of uh, basically any model you want. And then, in the second step, this BKKL result is not that good to actually prove sharpness in higher dimension, for technical reasons, but with the OSSS inequality, you can really prove sharpness for all these uh, models in higher dimension. Why? Because the inequality extends, and then it's just a question of finding the right algorithm to discover your function zero connected to boundary. And you can prove that for all these models, you can define a function with low revealment, an algorithm with low revealment. So this changed completely the deal. And now we have sharpness for all these results. So maybe I should just, I mean, it's difficult to, to state a theorem. I mean, I don't like to state my theorem, but. Um, so the, maybe the most important contribution, because that was uh, our motiva motivation at first, and also uh, the thing that really triggers the rest, is uh, the Menchikov uh, Eisenman Barsky result, but for FK percolation. And really now we have a pretty deep understanding of what is happening for P smaller than PC for a very large class of percolation. Okay, I worked, so I want you to work a little bit as well. 
So I'm going to finish by an open question. Okay? And the open question, I mean, it's very easy to, to state, but uh, not so simple, I hope, to, to, uh, to prove, is let's forget about all the class, I mean, all the talk. Let's say uh, you, you stop at the first definition, which was the definition of PC for Bernoulli percolation. Okay? So the definition of PC was telling you below, for P smaller than PC, there is no infinite connected component, almost surely. For P larger than PC, there is an infinite connected component, almost surely. Well, prove that at PC, there is no connected component, almost surely. So, co conjecture at PC, and uh, let's say uh, we are on ZD, probability that there exists an infinite connected component is zero. Right? The definition of PC only gives you information on P larger than PC and P smaller than PC. It doesn't tell you what is happening at PC. And the question is prove that. And just to surprise you a little bit, I should tell you that this is proved in dimension 2. That's not very surprising, and you will even see how we do it on Friday. But it's also proved in dimension 11 and more, which is maybe a little bit more surprising. So if you want to surprise people, really do it. For instance, in dimension 3, which is a physical dimension. Thank you very much. So, so all the ergodic properties of the model, they are fairly, uh, I mean, so, so, I mean, with a given size which is not growing, with, uh, I mean, which is not big, it's not very uh, interesting uh, to, to look, for instance, at the number, I mean, the proportion of those that have uh, cardinality 7 or something like that. What is going to be interesting is to really look at you know, as a function of n, when n tends to infinity. So what is the proportion? But that is basically equivalent to what is the probability that the connected component of zero has a certain size, how does it decay? And this is exactly related to this type of thing. So for p smaller than pc, we have an exponential decay on this probability. And at pc, it's going to be polynomial decay. And this we are going to see on Friday exactly why it's like that. So it's polynomial at PC. Actually, not always, but for Bernoulli calculation, it is. Yes? Is the amount of this one for finite graphs is always true? Let's say, so if I take a fixed fixed random graph and I do calculation this one over D minus 1, so, so, so if you, you, you mean if, you, if I take, for, I mean, maybe uh, to stay with, with uh, So the simplest is, uh, is a complete graph with uh, three equals uh, one over Yeah, so what is going to happen in these cases, and it's going to be the same thing if you take a box of size n and you look at PC and you look at what is happening in it, is that you are going to have macroscopic clusters, the cluster of the size of the box. But only with positive probability, not probability tending to one, not probability tending to zero. For instance, typically, if you take a square lattice and you take a box of size n, we are going to see that the probability of crossing this box, of having a, a connected component which crosses this box, or say a connected component of size n over 2, is bounded away from 0 and 1. So it's exactly this place where it's balanced. George? Is there anything known about uh, the transition percolation the Volta model. Okay, so <laughs> this was a special daily case for you in some sense. So um, for G, when you take percolation starting from GFF, so you, you, st you sample your GFF and let, you look at level lines. It's now, yeah, yeah, Gaussian field, sorry. And, and you take the level lines. Then uh, you know how to prove there is sharpness. And the thing is that this is a model which is in the same universality class, basically, as the model you are mentioning motor on the water. So this, the, I mean, actually deducing this sharpness is not that simple just from the, what I explained. So this is a paper that we are finishing to write. 
uh, I'm finishing writing these days. The next step for the poor students that are working on it is actually to try the voter model. So I'm pretty confident that there is something to do there. I think we should be able to prove them. And in particular, as if you want, proving sharpness is going to be in, at the same time proving the existence of the phase transition, which is uh, the thing that you want. Other question? So, I, I have a question about this exercise which you gave us. Yeah. Isn't there a counter example in case of correlated percolation? So, it, actually, it, it's going to be related to what I want to explain uh, on, on, on uh, Friday and related to the fact that, uh, I mean, I told you that the probability of being in a big cluster is decaying polynomially. This is not always true. And for this model, for instance, the answer depends on the value of Q. When Q in 2D, when Q is smaller or equal to 4, there is going to be polynomial decay. But when Q is larger than 4, in fact, there would be exponential decay. And it's the same in higher dimension. For these models, when Q is large, you can prove that there is exponential decay, I mean, with this definition, exponential decay of the, of the probability that zero is connected to distance n. But if you modify a little bit the definition, then you can get positive probability at criticality of having an infinite connected component. So what's this the is question for independent case? Sorry? The, the exercise which you gave us was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, this, this is really the Bernoulli. Uh, I cannot be attacked. I mean, my lawyer is... Uh, Saying that well, that's the example is proven by you. So. Yeah, but that's not a good reason to uh, mislead you. Yeah. But no, no, I mean, the, I mean it's not. Uh, I mean. Right. Okay. Additional questions? So, before we thank the speaker, I would like to remind you that the third lecture will be on Friday uh, from 2 to 3. And uh, for those who are fortunate enough to be students here, there's going to be a meeting, I guess, tomorrow at noontime of the speaker with our graduate students. So thank you again.